music is working. Yes. Um, I'm going to invite my husband, Chris Limo, to do the readings. <laughs> Um, we're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 9. Nathan rebukes David. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take, care, to take one of his flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did, no, he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with a sword of the Ammonites. The second reading is from Genesis chapter 39, verse one to nine, isn't it? Um, Genesis 39, verse one to nine. Now Joseph has been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, uh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he, became, he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in, the house, in this house. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, verse 12, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Um, I'm so excited. The worship was great. I'm so amazed. Um, that is our music student Jackie, and thank you for doing, <laughs> thank you for doing such a good work, uh, and the worship team as well. Um, I'm also proud that some of my students I can see them here, um, so I think we are representing. But we are also a department that believes that the arts belong to God, and we should, we the church should not be abandoning the arts to the world. And that is why we teach in a Christian university. And some of you know that we are offering hip hop this semester. <laughs> for the same reason, because we believe we need to return our arts back to God. And hopefully later in the semester, we shall be announcing that we want to go and conquer the Kenya Music Festival. And we shall be sending a choir. So if you're interested, please watch out for the announcements on our Facebook page. 
So today I was told to ask to talk about uh, sexual harassment. And um, after I speak, um, two, three people are going to share some poetry. Like I said, we are about the arts. Um, we shall have a poem from Charlotte. I, I don't know where she's sitting. Yes. And then Shingai will follow. Shingai. OK. And then Paul will finish with a poem which was written for this occasion by Skills, but he was not able to come, so he's going to read it. So um, I'll just let you come in that order instead of me announcing. So once I finish Charlotte, you can come. All right. Uh, when I was asked to discuss this topic last, of sexual harassment last semester, um, it was around the time I was hearing very disturbing stories about sexual bullying in Daystar. I'm not even talking about Kenya. Um, I had heard of students being asked to see lecturers in offices behind closed doors, of students going to administrative offices and a suggestion being made that uh, the service would be rendered after a certain favor is given. And I have been single in this uh, university for quite some time before the Lord blessed me with a husband. And I also know how it is to work as a single woman. You, always, you often get um, offers um, uh, that uh, maybe you're a bit lonely and you need some company. And this by men who made the same promise to another woman. So I know what it is like to, be, to work in an environment where you are uncomfortable because of uh, some sexual innuendos that are made. And pr probably because I'm a woman, I hear most of the stories from the, uh, from the women as the victims. But I also know that there are some cases of women making men feel awkward, um, especially in the classroom and around the time of exams. But um, what is common in all these cases is this. It's that one party exploits institutional advantage or power and makes another person feel awkward. So one has the power to give grades, to give a service, or to falsely accuse someone, while the other feels that they, may, they have to give in to the advances if they want the service done, or to lose their jobs, or to get a bad grade um, that will affect their job prospects. And for women, we have an additional fear, which is their fear of our reputation. Because we are told hurtful things, and this I was told a number of times, no wonder you're not married. You can't get a husband if you're tough like this. And we also fear that if we speak up, we will be, we will be accused of destroying families, as if the person who harassed us is not the one who should be thinking of his family. The responsibility is the woman's. Um, so, even though, but even though sexual harassment uses sex, it is not about sex. It is about power and about vulnerability. One person is in power and the other one is vulnerable. And as we have seen in the scriptures, what annoys God is not the sex. It is that, that the, there was an abuse of power. Um, when we see in the story that Nathan gave, okay, we already know what the story of David and Bathsheba of a woman who was on the roof, a husband at war, and a king who abdicated his responsibility and tried to cover up his sin by murdering Bathsheba's husband. And those details are in 2 Samuel 11. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, we see Nathan going to King David to express the Lord's disgust at what David had done. And in the illustration that Nathan uses, um, he, a rich man, and we'll call him Tajiri, who had more than enough, decides that he's not going to lose anything, and that someone with much less than he had, let's call him Maskimi, uh, would pay the price of feeding Tajiri's guests. But I th notice also in the story that there's a value that each of the men had placed on their animals. Tajiri doesn't, we, the only thing we know about Tajiri is that he was rich. But what we know about Maskini is that he loved the animal. It was like a member of his own family. So why on earth would Tajiri go for uh, Maskini's animal? And from my perspective, I think the problem was that Tajiri actually admired what Maskini had. Maskini had a loving family and a passionate life with this one animal, but Tajiri had no such thing. We only know that he was rich. And so Tajiri looked at Maskini and wished that he had that kind of family, that he had that kind of love. And then God says, 
that the same applied to David. And in fact, God reminds David that he had everything. And in verse, six, uh, verse 8, God says, if this had not been enough, I would have given you much more. As in, the problem, that if David wanted more, God was willing to give him. So why would a king who has so much and a God who is even willing to give him more, why would he take just one wife? And he had many wives by that time. Why would he take just the one wife of Uriah? And the way I see it, I think David was empty. It's very lonely to be in power. One has so much in admiration, so many people hanging around you, but it's difficult to know if the people are there because they love you or because they want something from you. And so, um, normally powerful people like to look for an ordinary day when they can just be an ordinary person, and probably that's why David was on the rooftop. He didn't feel like being king. He wanted to take a break from being king. Maybe he had sex with Bathsheba so that he can be an ordinary man. But one thing we know, you know, all this I've speculated, but one thing we know is that David was not supposed to be on the rooftop. He was supposed to be in the battlefield with his men in battle. And it didn't help that when Uriah came home, he kept saying, no, I can't drink or I can't sleep with my wife because there are men in the battlefield. I have to think of them. And the Bible doesn't mention this, but what David did could, had the potential to destroy not just his army, but the whole of Israel. Because imagine if the, if the soldiers found out what David did. They would have said, here we are, far from home, fighting for Israel, and yet the king of Israel, all he'll do is take our wives and, put her and, and get, have us killed. So that could have demoralized the army, and not only demoralized the army, but it put the whole nation of Israel at risk. As in, because David sinned in this one sin, David almost risked the kingdom of Israel. So, are we, in are we in positions of responsibility? What is our battlefield? Because all of us have a battlefield. Are we in the battlefield or are we on the rooftop? Because if you're on the rooftop, and if you're not on the battlefield with the rest of the troops, you are going to covet others. You're going to look at others and wish that you had what they had, instead of you fighting the battles that God sent, sent you to, to fight. For example, in our education system, we know we have taken so many shocks over the last, let's say, three months. We have been basically told that the education system does nothing. Um, you will hear people saying graduates are nothing, which I think is very unfortunate. And our education system has been so commodified that the parents and students care more for certificates than for learning. And the students copy paste, and remember we talked about that last year, um, and, we, and we lecturers, we feel we cannot push you because if we do and you don't graduate fast enough, we will lose the market. And, but you see, what concerns, and what concerns me even more other than this commodification of education is the minimal academic production that is happening. In Africa alone, by 2014, was producing only 2% of the world's academic knowledge. Only 2%. So you can see for us lecturers, we, are not, we have to fight not only commodification, but we have to fight the alienation of Africa in their, their, the world's academy. Um, and you don't even need to look very far. Just pick any thesis in our library and go to the bibliography and see how many people are cited who are from Africa. Usually they are about a third. In fact, a third is a good number. Most of them are non-Africans. So that means even if we, you see some of us here being called doctor, we are not providing African solutions to African problems. And that's what we need to be doing, not sitting on the rooftop looking at, at students who are just here to learn. So we need to be on the rooftop, because if we are not on the rooftop, we are likely to be drowned in envy as we watch the students minding their own business. And if we are not feeling, fulfilling our purpose, we are like, likely to think that the students are having a better time than us, and maybe that if we have what the students have, they will feel less, we will feel less empty. The way Tajiri thought that he envied the family of Maskini and then wanted to be like him, but did not want to pay the price. So that's the same kind of envy we read about in Genesis 39. 
Uh, Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar was a very powerful woman. Um, she had such influence over her husband that she just needed to say the word and somebody would be thrown in jail without a trial, without verification of what, whether he had done what she said he had done. And, and it is possible, as is typical with, with patriarchy, that Mrs. Potiphar did not have a purpose of her own that was independent of her husband. She was restless, unlike Joseph. Yet Joseph, if anyone should have been restless, it should have been Joseph, because he had suffered the ultimate betrayal. His brothers had sold him to foreigners. But instead of being sad about it, he worked very hard in, the, in Potiphar's house, and the Lord blessed everything he did. And then Joseph did not even exploit the power he had. He served with, with a lot of diligence. In other words, Joseph was a man of self-confidence and integrity, the kind of man that many of us women wish for. And as if that man, as if that was not good enough or bad enough, depending on how you look at it, Joseph was good looking. He was sexy. He had everything going for him. So, so here you have a contrast between a self-confident man of integrity and the emptiness of a powerful, purposeless woman. And Mrs. Potiphar couldn't handle it. She felt that she needed what Joseph had, and the way to do it was to have sex with him. But you see, do you see what Joseph tells her? He doesn't tell her, I made a vow of abstinence until I'm married. What does he say? He says, your boss, my boss trusts me. And this he, he, he did not give me the permission to do. He talked about the impact of the relationship, not, not his, his holiness. He talked about what could be the repercussions of sleeping with her. And then most of all, he, the, the most important thing that Joseph does is that he lets Mrs. Potiphar know that you may have all the power in this Egypt, but you still don't have the power to make me disobey God. I am willing, I am willing to lose my freedom, but I am not going to lose my dignity. That's what Joseph basically said. So, if, if, you're, if you have ever been made to feel awkward in campus, for example, it's possible that you are a Joseph, actually. You're probably young, you're beautiful, and for the most part, you don't even know it. Uh, you're just minding your own business, trying to, to get your grades, trying to do your assignments. And before you know it, there's a Mrs. Potiphar knocking at your door, asking, come and see me in the office. Um, and why? And why are they doing that? It's because you have something we wish we had. We are in our 40s and 50s. We don't have our youth anymore. We don't have dreams, as much dreams. We have been battered by the cynicism of life. You have possibilities. For us, you know, we no longer know what our possibilities are. You have fewer responsibilities than we do. You see, we can't just walk up and say, we ha I want to follow my dream, because we have to think of our children and our rents to pay. So you have a freedom that we don't have, and probably that is what is making you attractive, so to speak, to us. So, but no matter how powerful your lecturer, or that manager at the company where you're interning, or that pastor is, you have to declare like Joseph that there are some lines that you won't cross. They can, be all, they can have all the power in the world, but there are some lines they cannot make you cross. Because if you cross them, you are endangering not just yourself. And that's what we talked about last semester when I was talking about um, your, your uh, what. There was a, someone I preached where I was saying, your story is enough. I was saying that if you give up your dignity, you're also compromising the rest of the system. So you're endangering not only yourself, but others. You're endangering our education system, and the soul, which is the soul of our nation. And, and many times women are told that it is their fault, that it's their fault, they are being harassed, that they are too uh, attractive. Why are you so loud and vocal? This is what is making you very noticeable. But here I'm telling you, uh, do not be ashamed of who you are. If you have talent, walk with your head up high, praise the Lord with it. If you are brilliant in class, praise the Lord and run with it. Do not be ashamed of who you are. Hold your head up high. 
But remember, and I want you to remember that some of you students have been in awkward positions, even some of the members of staff. Remember that Joseph resisted because he had help. He had help from God, and you too, you can get help from, you can get from the fellow, help from the fellowship. So if there's a Mrs. Potiphar or a King David hanging around you, tell them to go back to the rooftop. We'll get off the roof, rooftop and go to the battlefield where they should be. And if you need our help, call us. Call the lecturers, call members of staff to help you, to, to remind the person who is harassing you to get off the rooftop and go back to the battlefield. And I want to just um, leave a message for my brothers. We need you in the battlefield, not on the rooftops. Our history as a people is a history of women and men standing up to oppression and saying that we have dignity as African people. But what is happening now, the, the men we are being told are men are the men who sell drugs to our kids. And those are the role models for your sons and the predators of our daughters. What have we, we want you men, we be, because you told us that you are our protectors. What have you said to these predators who are, uh, who are feasting on our youth, who are stealing their money? These young people, some of them are not going to have enough money to have a business. They are supposed to borrow, but the money they are supposed to borrow has been stolen. Where are the fathers and the protectors to, to say enough of this? Where are the fathers and protectors to say that the, the, the women should not be victimized? We want you in the battlefield and not on the rooftops. And I know, for example, Caroline Mutoko said something that I remembered yesterday when I was with my class. She said that the university has become the last vestige of e my ego, meaning that what we talk about here, especially as lecturers, is do we have a master's or a PhD? How big are we? And when students challenge us, we tell them, who has the PhD here? <laughs> this, this kind of rooftop arrogance, which we see especially in the public universities, we need to throw it away in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the battlefield. We are in the battlefield for our education. For these young people who are sitting here, we want them to have good lives. This is not the time to show off our degrees. We have to fight for them, to fight for them to have a better, a better education, and for their children to have better education. That's what we are here for. What have we said about the fact that mothers can no longer get medical help when they are giving birth? Have lecturers said anything? Have we talked about it in our class? Have we talked about the state of our nation that is actually going down the drain, if we are not careful? What have lecturers said? That's our battlefield. Let's get off the rooftop and start doing some work. And please, my brothers, it's not because we, we women don't like you. It's because we believe in you. When you tell us that you're protectors, that's exactly what we are expecting. Get off the rooftop. So I'm going to, to finish with just saying this, and then I'll call um, Charlotte to come and present a poem. And Charlotte's poem, I, she wrote it, which was very interesting. She wrote it when we were having a meeting following our story about your dignity is priceless. Now I remember. And we had a meeting as ladies, and she wrote this poem about your, your dignity as young women. And then after that, we're going to have uh, a poem by Shingai, but I want to talk about the last poem, which is by a man, so that you don't call, tell me that I'm bashing the male child. Um, it's by a man, and it will be, it's just about what I'm saying, you know, are the men in the battlefield or are they on the rooftop? Um, and I'm going to conclude by saying this. Sexual harassment is not about sex. It's about power and about vulnerability. If you notice in the story of Nathan, God's major concern was not the sex that David and Bathsheba had. His concern was the injustice of betrayal and the murder of Uriah, a fellow soldier, and the potential havoc that David's action could have posed to Israel. And you notice that God does not uh, apply blame equally in this case. 
he applied blame only to David, because, not because David was a man, but because David was in power. He was, the one, he was the one in charge, and he did not fulfill his responsibility as king. So let us pray that we who have been given the responsibility um, to serve others, that we will use it to protect the people in our care. I know, you know, like our music students, I told them the other day, um, I told them none of you are going to go and perform at, uh, at politicians' rallies. I don't want to see you singing at politicians' rallies. And I told them, this is what I told them, if anyone dares hire you, tell the politician I will come for them. I won't even come for you, I will come for them. What are they doing with my students? <laughs> That's my job. My job is to protect my students. And I will come for them if they dare touch my students. Yeah. I'm in the battlefield. I'm in the battlefield. I'm not on the rooftop. So let us pray that those of us who have responsibility that we will take care of our people. Let us pray also because I know that there are many of you students who have been hurt and injured by the betrayal you felt at our hands. Can I just say forgive us, but also that you need healing and we, we will help you. Please talk to us. There are so many good people who will be able to help you. There are people in um, D, the, the counselors, DC3. I also know Mrs. Odima is a wonderful person. You should talk to her if you have any of these issues. Don't, don't suffer in silence and we will pray for you. And then let us pray most of all that we remain in the battlefield, struggling for the integrity of our students and for the dignity of our people in this great nation called Kenya. Let us pray. Father, this is a very hard sermon to take, especially for us older people who have failed these young people in maintaining our responsibility but we also know that we are not alone. This nation is full of adults who have failed to take, to, to fulfill their responsibility to protect the younger ones, the vulnerable ones. And Father, we are praying that you would forgive us. I am also praying for people who may have been hurt by us, the adults, for betraying them. And I don't know if there's anyone who'd like to raise their hands so that I can pray for you. If this has happened to you, because I am not, I, I, I do not pretend that we are perfect here. If this has happened to you, would you like to raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Okay, I'm going to assume that if, 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 um, if this has happened to you, I'm going to assume that you will come and see us after this. So Father, I'm also praying for the victims of this betrayal. So many people have been betrayed when they were kids, by house girls, when they were in primary school, by teachers, when they were adults, by pastors, because we, the adults, did not fulfill our responsibilities. Father, I am praying that you may heal them. Father, remind them that you can see what they are going through and that you care enough, that you sent your son to die for us because you cared enough. Remind them. And remind us as an institution at Daystar to, to, to be the light, to be the salt of the earth, to show others how education is supposed to be done. Education is supposed to be about becoming better people, about being knowledgeable and using that knowledge to serve others, not to get degrees or to be prestigious, it's to serve others. And that is the servant leadership we have been called for. And I pray that you may make Daystar the, the, the light to the rest of the world about how education is done. And now I commit the poets who are coming that, Lord, you may bless them as they perform your word through the, this great talent that you have given them. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I am Charlotte Ainebeona Kigezo from Uganda. And um, my poem is entitled, I'm Just 21 so I hope you enjoy. I was inspired to write, not because I was listening to Bob Marley or Lauryn Hills, but because I'm 21 and the society has decided I will not dream. In the beginning, I was not meant to be too educated. One degree, one certificate, 
and then I'm the perfect wife for a 45 year old man. I am lonely at 21. I am growing old at 21. I need babies soon at 21. Now these are the reasons to why I'm getting really fed up of this world. I mean, I'm only 21. I have just started understanding who I am. A woman, yes, with needs, yes, but still I have standards. I still have dreams. I want to tour, probably meet Oprah, maybe win an Oscar, or write a play and watch it make it to the Amy's. What is wrong with dreaming? I mean, I'm just 21. I'm still very adventurous. I still giggle when my own father gives me a compliment. I mean, I am just 21. Let me enjoy. Thank you. Morning. How are you? Okay. Um, so I'll just start. I'll start by trying something. Raindrop. Raindrop. Okay. Rooftops. So you say you couldn't help yourself, staring at her long, long legs that went on and on for days, hips moving in ways words could do no justice to. Body curved in a way that breaks your thought process in two, skin painted by a brush that only a master artist would use. Desire creeping into your heart slowly, unlike what would be a quick thrust, somehow finding a way to normalize the ugliness that is your lust. You blame her. Why? It's not her fault she consumes your mind, can't eat, can't sleep, can't deny. This whispered claims of love to her are a lie. A broken way to justify your want and need of something you have no right wanting or needing. To justify your stealing of others' belonging, taking her biblically termed as knowing the secrets, intricates of her being, parts defined by one who formed her from nothing, for only the one who would love her as everything. Yet, here you are, being her sugar daddy. Giving more pain than sugar, daddy, tell her unborn child how he was conceived by one who was infused with the blood of kings running through his veins after God's own heart he was named, yet B.C., A.D., and even to this day, sons of Adam, men like David, have failed. You were given a mission, a vision, a responsibility to lead, but instead you are out there inserting your seed into every cave that will willingly and sometimes unwillingly receive. Bragging to your boys about last night like you did some majestic deed, refusing to see your kernel need for what it actually is, a want solely to feed your fragile ego, so you say you couldn't help yourself. Staring at her long, long legs that went on and on for days, hips moving in ways words could do no justice to. Body curved in a way that would break philosophers' thought processes in two, skin painted by a brush that only a master refined artist would use. You say you couldn't help yourself, but you lie. The truth you can't deny is that while you were sexualizing and objectifying parts of her that made you hard inside, when thoughts of her made you grunt instead of softly sigh, you were conveniently forgetting the mantle placed over your own life. Content to complacently watch your country die, the people, the children, let them cry. Tears of blood shedding from each eye as you stole her blood, they bled out your future and past, rooted in this one act of lust. King David, now would be a good time to trust me when I say sex is not just sex. Given any context, it is power and vulnerability, it is poetry, it is pain, it is beauty. When given, not taken, it is safety, but until then, it is not a priority. Unless she's the only one who will be your priority, then her body is not a necessity. Let me clap back for the ones in the back. Unless she is the only one who will be your priority, her body is not your necessity. So, 
Next time you are on the rooftop and you see her long, long legs that go on and on for days, hips moving in ways words could do no justice to, body curved in a way that would break the greatest mind thought processes in two, skin painted by a brush that only a master refined artist would use, don't say you couldn't help yourself. Get off the rooftop, find your battle, fight a more worthy struggle, and help yourself. Thank you. Wow. <sighs> Morning. Hey, Dr. Wandia, come on. I mean, wow, amazing. Um, my name is Paul Chege. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, but this is not my own composition. Um, as they say, yeah, yeah, as they say, listen to the words and not the performance. Listen, but anyway, um, uh, it's a poem entitled um, Whose World Is This by David O.U.K. Black Skills. Um, just turn me down a bit. Thank you. All right. Whose world is this? The world is mine. How slowly lyrics grow up, rebel, and turn into fully fledged words carved into tombstones we may never know. How barely breathing mothers would push out death from their wombs unknowingly and raise it until it resembles a man strong enough to push her into the ground. Those who knew, sorry, those who grew up calling her flower then began to mask her scent, left her tucked back into the world by the dust of affections past until the only memories they let live of her were themselves. Whose world is this? The world is mine. He who slaps her so hard, his palms have more of her DNA than his own. And to crown it all, turns her crown into a cast, as these loving hands left her bedridden on her throne. Maybe to him her face was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and her soul was in, indecently dressed. And that's why she deserved to be pushed around like shopping carts, because after all, Nothing, was re nothing really was found after all, but remnants. That is what he made her become. Who, whose world is this? The world is mine. Where the hands that brought roses in the morning leave traps in the night, where the lips that kiss you in the night reveal their venom in the day, how love is only good when made in the dark than lived out in the world. This love that is a plague that keeps this love that is a plague that keeps you crawling back. When shall it become when shall it become calling out your firstborn? When shall it drown you in your chariots? When shall it let you let me go? Whose world is this? Is it really mine? When I'm a, when I am but a shadow of shadows, hiding in the cracks, watching you raped and shamed. Then after the deal is done, give your apologies as change. Coins coined up to hide my neglect. Leave you to pocket them just like my strength. No man deserves the title strong when his strength is a source of pain to those who cannot help themselves. No man deserves the title strong when his strength is a source of pain to those who cannot help themselves. Weak men have been called strong because strong men thought the wars were done. Only men of strength can say that this, that this world cannot be mine. If you are trapped and I am free, kings with dying queens, what type of world would that be? These hands must, be, these hands must piece back uh, broken crowns for us to be called strong. They must wash your bruised feet. They must return your smile and plant your flag in a land you faced defeat. Make you feel safe among hungry lions, for what are lions to a man they, they call king? A man for your love who will become both lion and bear, storm and hole, just to bring you back to the sun. Build your refuge from a rubble of the world they left on your back. Lay down lives because we know when you leave, then we will live forever. Whose world is this? when we put back our armor and guard our gates, then this world will be yours and we will be the men who would always remind you of it. Thank you very much.